It all starts with a painting. An unassuming and naturalistic scene, a group of picnickers sitting amongst gum trees and rocks in the Australian bush. The rocks serve as the title for the 1875 painting At the Hanging Rock by William Ford. The picnicking group perhaps serve as one of the key inspirations for what is arguably the most successful mystery novel to be written by an Australian, Picnic at Hanging Rock by Joan Lindsay. The story tells of the disappearance of a group of schoolgirls and the book famously ends without explanation for what happened to them. Join me now as we delve into the dark side of this mystery novel and discover how Joan Lindsay may have pieced together her gothic masterpiece. Fact or Fiction Reading from the dust jacket of the book's first edition, here's what we learn. The time is the summer of the year 1900, the place the Mount Macedon district of Victoria. On the 14th of February, St. Valentine's Day, a party of 19 girls accompanied by two school mistresses sets off from fashionable Apple Yard College for a day's picnic to Hanging Rock. This picnic which begins so innocently and happily in the warm summer's morning, ends in inexplicable terror for all concerned. And so the mystery begins. Though the commentary has an addendum, before the first chapter even begins, a full page is devoted to what is arguably the most discussed and debated controversy surrounding the book. It reads, Whether Picnic at Hanging Rock is fact or fiction, my readers must decide for themselves. As the fateful picnic took place in the year 1900 and all the characters who appear in this book are long since dead, it hardly seems important. So from the very onset, we are drawn in with the suggestion that the story, at least in part, may be based on fact. According to biographer Jane McCulloch in her book titled Beyond the Rock, when Joan's manuscript was accepted by the Melbourne publishing company F.W. Cheshire, junior editor Sandra Forbes wrote back to her saying, I really enjoyed reading this. It seems to have the right blend of truth and fiction. Given that the actual disappearance of the girls is a fact, it is a fascinating problem, well presented in a style very much in keeping with the period and personages involved. When the book was being adapted some years later into a film, screenwriter Cliff Green felt that he had to ask the question when he first met Joan. The same question was also asked by the director of the film, Peter Weir, who has said that he had been told by Joan's publisher not to ask Lady Lindsay whether the story is true or not. Over coffee, however, Peter couldn't resist and was met with the response, Young man, I hope that you do not ask the question again. In avoiding answering anyone's question as whether or not the story was based on fact or is a work of fiction, Joan had deliberately only added to the mystery. Was she right to do so? The answer perhaps lay in a counter-question. Would there have been so much interest in the story if it were known to be a work of pure imagination? The Truth Countless readers of the book, believing Joan's words, that the story was at least based in part in fact, have tried to find evidence in records. Inevitably, a brick wall has come upon. Victoria State Library, who get a lot of inquiries about missing schoolgirls in 1900, have scoured the records and found no missing schoolgirls mentioned in state or local newspapers of the time. Interestingly, during location filming in February 1975, Picnic at Hanging Rock executive producer Pat Lovell later mentioned that she found a monument marking the disappearance of three children near Hanging Rock in 1867. That's exactly 100 years before publication of the book. There are two monuments that Pat could have been describing. On the main highway outside Dalesford, There's a small memorial that was built in 1967 to mark the centenary of the children's disappearance. Although this may have been the one that Pat saw in 1975, Joan would not have seen it before writing the book in 1966. The other monument, however, stands above the children's shared grave and was put in place at a much earlier time. Also, the story is well known to locals. An award is even given out each year in their honour at local schools, and because of this, there's every chance that Joan had heard about the tragedy. However, Dalesford is close but not that close. It's 50 kilometres from Hanging Rock, and the three children that went missing were not schoolgirls, but boys aged four, five and six. 
So although this makes for a tantalising connection, surely the debate will continue. Many have also suggested that Joan based her story on her own experiences, having attended Clyde Girls Grammar School not far from Hanging Rock. Though the school did exist, was indeed located near Hanging Rock in the town of Macedon, and Joan was most definitely a former alumna of the school, at the time she attended, however, the school was located in St Kilda, a suburb of Melbourne, and only moved to Macedon five years after Joan's last year there. There is a thin thread of fact that begins to appear at this point in the story, though. As part of her 1990 thesis titled Fact and Fiction in Joan Lindsay's Picnic at Hanging Rock, Sarah Elfrith took upon herself the Herculean task of attempting to prove whether there were or were not any comparable teachers present at Clyde Girls Grammar School during Joan's youth that she perhaps may have repurposed for Appleyard College. As it turns out, there was. A Miss McCraw taught there during Joan's time at the school, and Miss McCraw is also the name of the teacher who goes missing in the book. But apart from the name, the factual Miss McCraw would otherwise seem to bear no resemblance to the fictional character. Intriguingly, though, we will come back to Miss McCraw in a moment. In her unpublished memoirs, as witnessed by biographer Janelle McCulloch, and mentioned in her biography of Joan, in 1963, Joan had told her good friend Colin Caldwell that she wanted to write a novel about a place that had always fascinated her. She then produced a print of an 1875 painting by William Ford of a group picnicking at Hanging Rock. Caldwell asked when she'd last seen Hanging Rock. She couldn't remember, she said. So off the two of them went in Caldwell's car for an afternoon picnic. We took cold duck and a bottle of wine, wrote Joan. This possibly contradicts a claim made by Joan when first writing to her to-be publisher that the story came to her in dreams over several nights in the winter of 1966. Here instead was evidence suggesting that she had been working on an idea based around the rock for at least three years prior. Furthermore, the print that Joan showed Caldwell was of a painting acquired by the National Gallery of Victoria in 1950, while Joan's husband, Darrell Lindsay, had been director there. More significantly, according to writer Philip Adams in an article that he wrote for the Australian newspaper, the painting had hung in Darrell's office at the NGV for years. Joan had also been very active working behind the scenes of the gallery during much of that time, and there's every chance that seeing this painting on a near-daily basis may perhaps have sown a seed with her. A School for Thought in an article written for the La Trobe Journal in May 2009, entitled Joan Lindsay, A Time for Everything, Terence O'Neill explains Joan's close ties to her old family of Clyde Girls Grammar School. She was docs of the school in 1913. She was briefly editor of the school magazine, The Clothan, and designed the school crest. After leaving school, she became secretary of the Old Girls Association, and would have followed with interest the move of the school in 1919 to Wood End, not far from Hanging Rock. Joan's continued connection to the school adds yet another piece of evidence to suggest that Joan had been hovering around the book idea for some time. An article in the Clothan dated December 1919 and written by Miss McCraw tells of a photographic excursion undertaken to Hanging Rock. Referring back to Terence O'Neill's well-researched article, there are striking parallels in Lindsay's novel to a number of the descriptions in the 1919 account. In both, the picnic party is accompanied by a teacher named Miss McCraw. In both, the girls as they approach the rock have difficulty crossing a stream. In both, they arrive at the foot of the rock in the late afternoon. In the article, they depart the rock freshly clad and return at night as sorry objects. In the novel, they leave as orderly rows of girls in hats and gloves, and yet those who eventually return, also at night, are hatless, dishevelled, incoherent. The real Miss McCraw and her charges climb to the summit, which they reach in the dark, and see the moon through her film of misty clouds. While in the novel, Irma exclaims, If only we could stay out all night and watch the moon rise. O'Neill continues, it seems extraordinary that the girls on that first excursion to Hang Rock on Thursday 6th of November 1919 should have been allowed to climb to the summit, even today a hazardous undertaking in the dark. Time also seems to have been of little concern, as it must have been close to midnight before the girls arrived back at Clyde on a hired dray. No doubt they had exciting stories to tell the rest of the girls. It soon became a tradition to tell spooky stories on the way home from picnics to the rock, Following the 1919 excursion, a tradition began with a picnic to the rock each year for the next 40 years. 
the 1938 picnic was special, as almost as important of what would take place decades later, and included the filming of a play performed on the rock by the girls. Joan's cousin Barbara Weigel perhaps best summed up the special affinity of Clyde School with Hanging Rock when she wrote in the Clothan in 1929, Somehow we feel we own it. Sometimes we see it as a mysterious island when the valley below is filled with the white clouds of a mystic lake. In conclusion, like the painter that she had initially intended to be, Joan Lindsay knew that the viewer will see whatever they want to see in a canvas, and that giving them the freedom to find their own answers to the mystery before them could only enhance what she had created. Writing in Melbourne Studies and Education some years after Picnic in 1982, in a piece titled Scattered Memories of a Non-Education, Joan writes that she wrote Hanging Rock for her own joys and sorrows in attempting to translate a long-seen vision into words that would make the fateful picnic into a living reality. Joan had a lifetime of writing experience with which to paint her story, having sat down to pen Picnic at Hanging Rock not long before her 70th birthday and Joan, in her book, had created a painting in words, a mythological scene where time stood suspended, just like in the painting by Botticelli of Venus, to whom she'd likened her main character, Miranda. Picnic at Hanging Rock was a memory of her childhood. Her first words, she claimed, she'd spoken just near the rock. It encompassed her time at Clyde, from which she drew inspiration, and it was a love poem to Daryl, whom she married on Valentine's Day. This wasn't any demonically possessed creation, as some including herself have suggested. This was the work of a lifetime, and she knew it. Oh yes, and it was also about that damn painting that she couldn't get out of her head. You started out to be a painter and you became a writer. How did that happen? Well, I never was much of a painter, and I haven't got an enormous amount of... I don't think I'm a very marvellous writer. But... When I wanted to paint, I always wanted to paint people and I simply hadn't got a clue about drawing human beings. I could draw trees, not badly, I think, but that wasn't enough for me. I want to draw people and, and I'm terribly interested in people. I don't think you'll want to write if you're not. And as I got older, I realised that I could never sort of express myself, not that it matters to anybody but me, whether I did or didn't, but I did want to put what I felt about people and in their own settings. And I finally, when I married a painter, not because he was painting too, but I just thought, well, I think I'll switch over and I began to write. And I'd always loved writing when I was at school. Used to write these dead little essays, which everybody wrote. But now and again, I've looked at a few little things I wrote when I was a kid, and they were not too bad.